Hey guys, we're so glad to be able to connect with you today. Thanks so much for being part of Sugar Hill Church Online. Super grateful that we still get to connect with you through technology while still practicing social distancing, but not social disconnection. So thanks for being part of today. In fact, if there's a friend or somebody that you can invite to join us on the stream, please go ahead and do that. You can share this to your Facebook page or shoot them a text with the link to live.sugarhill.church. Well, over the last several weeks, we've been in a teaching series called the Sermon on the Mount. Now, if you're not familiar with it, in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, Jesus taught his most famous message. Thousands of people came to listen to him, and he sat down and he taught. And essentially, in those three chapters, he taught what the kingdom of God was to be like. So if you want to get at the heart of the message of Jesus, if you want to get what is a big deal to Jesus, check out the Sermon on the Mount. Well, right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount is a little prayer. It's not very long. In fact, it's only 68 words in my translation of the Bible. It's not very long, but it's super powerful. And it's Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray. Now think about it. Jesus spent a lot of time praying. His disciples saw him make a priority about prayer. They saw him get up very early in the morning. They saw him retreat from the busyness of life. They saw him pray, but they saw him pray differently than any other teacher they had seen. And so in Luke's account of this, they ask him the question, Lord, would you teach us to pray? And in response, Jesus gives us what most of us call the Lord's prayer. Some people call it the model prayer, but essentially he outlines how to talk to our heavenly father. And so today I just want to take this prayer phrase by phrase, verse by verse, and unpack it a little bit and invite you to pray with Jesus. And so the way that I learned this prayer was as a kid going to church and our whole church would recite it. I was at a funeral recently and the whole congregation at the funeral recited it. And so I'm going to invite you to do that even now. We're going to put the words on the screen because everybody's translation is just a little bit different, but I want to invite you to read this prayer out loud with me. You're like, really? Out loud? Absolutely. With family, friends, whoever you're gathered with, even if you're by yourself, to read this out loud. And here we go. Look at what it says in Matthew 6, starting in verse 9. It says, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debt as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Did you do it? Did you do it out loud? Let's do it again. All right. This time, read it with conviction. This time, say it like you mean it. Even if you've never done this before, hit pause on your uncertainty. And let's do this again together. Here we go. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts also as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I agree with what Pastor Chuck said a little bit earlier. There's no better time for us to talk about prayer than today. And what I love about this prayer is it's not super long. It's not very deep. It's a prayer that anybody can pray, no matter if you're new to this or you've been praying a long time. Anybody can pray regardless if you're by yourself or you're on the other side of the globe. Everybody is invited to this prayer that anybody can pray. And so let's look at it together. And then I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me. In fact, many of you have questions about prayer. Feel free to drop those in the, the comments below. And we'd love to be able to answer those as the morning goes on. But here's how Jesus opens the prayer. Here's this phrase. He says, our father who is in heaven. Now, there's three words that automatically pop out to me about this part of the prayer. He starts with that one little word, R, O-U-R. And what's interesting about this is he includes himself in it. So when he's talking about prayer and he says, here's the model or here's the principles of prayer, he includes himself in the prayer that he's teaching us to pray. One of the reminders about this prayer is that we're not praying this by ourselves. 
You may be alone in your room right now watching this, but when you pray our father in heaven, you're joining with the thousands of people that are connected through Sugar Hill Church, the millions of people that are praying something similar around the world. This is a way to remind us that Jesus is praying with you and Jesus is praying for you and you get to pray with Jesus. The second word is equally powerful. He says, our father, father. So when he addresses God, this is a reminder not to depersonalize our prayer, not to just use some formula or some words that we wouldn't ordinarily do or act like God is uh, disconnected from us. That word father is a reminder that he is personal. And we're praying to a father that hears his kids. We're praying to a father that relates to his kids. We're praying to a father that's not an inanimate object. Right? He's not somebody distant and disconnected. He's a father. And in fact, when Jesus prayed, he uses this intimate word for father. He uses the word Abba. In this sense, God is connected to us. He is happy. He is warm. He's trusting. He's enthusiastic. He's welcoming us. And so when Pastor Chuck often prays and blesses us at the end of our services, he talks about us either climbing up into the lap of our Heavenly Father or he talks about us wrapping our arms around his strong shoulders. The reason why he can say that is because that's the picture that Jesus gives us, that he's our dad who listens, who is wise, who is trusting, that he has our best interest in mind. And so if you know him, he's not just a father, he's your father. And if you don't know him, you can know him that way today by putting your faith and trust in him. He says, our father, and then here's the next phrase, who is where? In heaven. That phrase heaven reminds us that he's the creator of all things, that he's in charge of all things, that he's above all things, that he still reigns supreme. And so when you realize that God's in heaven, what it begins to do is it begins to shrink down the size of our struggles. And here's what I found in my own life is it fills us with confidence. And if there's a day and age that we need confidence and we need to have a proper perspective, it's today. And so that's the first part of this prayer. Our father who is in heaven. Now, one of the questions that came in a little while ago was about this next phrase. I read it a few minutes ago. We said it out loud. We said it hallowed. Now, the reason why I said it that way, that's how I grew up reciting it. But it's that one little word, hallowed. What does that even mean? In our day and age, we don't use that word a lot. We don't say hallowed a lot. But that one little line reminds us of a simple yet powerful truth. And here's the truth, that God's name is holy. His name's holy. His name is to be set apart that he radiates holiness, that everything else on this earth is dim and dull compared to him. He reveals himself by name. In fact, the the way I learned to pronounce the name when I took Hebrew uh, in graduate school was Yahweh or Yahweh. But our I think we would be wise to learn from our Jewish friends at, where they would not even try to pronounce that name. And so for centuries, they would never say that name out loud and they would substitute different letters or they would say out loud instead of saying Yahweh or Yahweh, they would say the name or in the New Testament, they would say the Lord. They took it very seriously. I think that's a good reminder for us is that God is different that God is holy. Yes, he's personable, and yet he's not our equal. He's God. He's above our pain. He's above our problems. He's above all things. And so to say, how would be your name means to say, God, I put your name above all else. God, I put your reputation above all else. And unfortunately, in our day and age, it's too easy for people to take his name for granted. Too easy for us to use it in some superstitious way or some slanderous way. So this part of the prayer says, God, you're above everything. Our Father who is in heaven, how would be your name? Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, he started it with this one announcement. He said, the kingdom of God is at hand. This was central in Jesus's teaching. He taught about the kingdom, the rule of God. 
the activity of God, the presence of God, God at work among us. He says it's not just something in the future. It's not just something that we're hoping for. He says it's here. It's now. It's real. It's present. It's right now. And so Jesus made that part of his teaching. So it's no wonder that when Jesus prayed that Jesus makes the kingdom of God his priority when he prays. Think about that. Jesus makes the kingdom of God his priority when he prays your kingdom come. And so when you and I pray that, we're praying it, recognizing that God does have a plan, that God is at work, that God has a best for each one of us. And so when Jesus makes the kingdom a priority, guess what? We should make the kingdom of God a priority. We should pray, God, not my will, but yours. This part of the prayer reminds us that Jesus's agenda is greater than my agenda that Jesus's plan is bigger than my plan, that what he wants ought to overrule what I want, that we would pray, God, we want your kingdom to come. We want your righteousness. We want your peace. We want your joy. We want the spirit to become obvious among us. God, help us to not miss that. God, help us to see your kingdom. I mean, that's why I love that today we get to witness Christian being baptized. That's a visible way of seeing the kingdom of God at work. That's why we've loved being able to, to see hundreds of families fed this week because we're seeing the kingdom of God at work. That's why we've loved seeing so many prayers pop up because that's the kingdom of God at work. God, would you let your kingdom come? But then this next phrase goes right behind that. Not only your kingdom come, but your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That phrase, the will, your will be done. It's the will of God. It's the plan of God. It's God, you know what's best for us. God, you're the one that created us. You, you have a best for us. You know what's best for us. You have a plan for us. And so we're praying, God, that your will would be done even now on earth like it is in heaven. One of the reasons why I love this part of the prayer is it's gutsy. It's participatory. It's saying, God, I want to join you in bringing your will into every detail of my life. He's inviting us to pray that way. Your will be done. One of the reasons why this is powerful for me is it sort of uh, realigns my day. It reminds me that as I live this day, the, the tug of my own heart is to do whatever I want. The tug of my own heart is to go my own path. And yet for me to pray, God, your will be done. It sort of says in my head, God, I know that you have a plan. It says in my heart, God, I want to align to that plan. And it says with my whole body, help me to walk towards it. God, would you let everything in heaven, hope, forgiveness, salvation, peace, would you bring that to earth? This part of the prayer fuses heaven and earth together. Isn't that powerful? What a great prayer. Again, these words aren't long, but the principles behind them are so rich. The next phrase is this phrase, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Bread was often used as a metaphor for Jesus. Jesus taught a lot about bread, multiple miracles Jesus did with bread. And so for everybody that's a low carber, what do you do with the phrase where Jesus says, I'm the bread of life? That's another sermon. That's another topic. But he says, give us this day our daily bread. Oftentimes that bread represents a need in our life. Oftentimes that bread represents something that's missing. And so I don't know what that is for you, but what I've seen in the world around us is that nothing quite wakens us up to prayer like an unmet need. Nothing gets our attention like some unmet need in our life. And so bread issues cause us to turn our focus to God and say, God, would you give us this day? I mean, that's one of the been the positive byproducts of this current epidemic that we're living through. This pandemic of the coronavirus is we've seen so many people turn to pray, so many people uh, pushing away the things that would normally distract them and come to their heavenly father in prayer. But what I love about this is he says, give us this day. So in other words, he's saying, don't worry about tomorrow yet. Don't worry about next week yet. 
don't worry about next month because if I know anything about our world, we're full of warriors and we, we, a lot of us are worst case scenario thinkers. We're like, well, what happens if I get laid off or what happens if the economy doesn't turn around or what happens? What if, what if, what if? Well, Jesus says, focus on this day, focus on this day and ask for your daily bread. Part of that phrase is to be thankful for what we do have. God, I still have a roof over my head. God, I haven't missed a meal yet. God, I, my, my, I'm still able to make my mortgage payment. God, I've still got air in my lungs today. God, I've got friends around me that are amazing. I've got family that's wonderful. And so part of it is a thankfulness that God's been gracious, but it's also a deliverance from, from anxiety, a deliverance from problems. See, what I found is that when we are caught up in anxiety and we're caught up in uncertainty, it brings out the worst in us. It is difficult to be generous towards others when we're weighted down by the haunting uncertainty of this day. It's difficult to live with an open hand to serve other people in the season when we feel like, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this day. And so this gives us comfort. This gives us courage to cast our cares on him, the worries that weigh us down. The next phrase is a powerful one. He says, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now think about this. Jesus reminds us to pray, forgive us of our trespasses, forgive us of our sins. I remember learning as a seventh grader that it's important to keep a short sin list. In other words, not to let them build up, not to let our hearts become calloused, not to miss the opportunity to say, God, I've broken your heart. God, I've broken your commands. God, would you forgive me? So it's important to pray that for ourselves. God, would you help me to confess my sin? In fact, as we pray this in a few moments, maybe there's some unconfessed sin in your life. Maybe there's some areas in your life that you've been holding on to. Maybe you've been ignoring. Maybe you, you haven't been paying attention to. This is a great part of the prayer to say, God, I ask for your forgiveness. God, I bring this to you. And he says, and forgive us our sin as we forgive those that have sinned against us. It's this reminder that since God has forgiven us, since God has extended grace to us, we too can then extend it to others. I mentioned just a moment ago that in seasons of uncertainty, it seems like the best in people comes out, but often the worst in people come out. I mean, I don't know if you've experienced this, but there's a lot of angry people around us. I mean, just go to Costco on a Saturday, even with social distancing, there are some angry people around us. I've talked to some small business owners this week that, that their customers are lashing out. It bring, uncertainty causes us to come from a place of fear. And so sometimes we wonder, well, how much grace should I extend them? How much forgiveness should I give out? And the answer really is, well, how much has God given you? How much has God forgiven you? How much grace has God given us? Where to come from that, that place to say, God, I'm going to extend it. I'm going to, I'm going to forgive hurts and I'm going to forgive memories. I'm going to, I'm going to let go of grudges. God, I'm going to get rid of these old wounds and resentments. I'm going to extend the same forgiveness that you've extended to me. And that's super powerful. This is practical. Jesus is giving sort of an outline. He's not saying you have to pray this word for word. He's given us the principles behind it. When you pray, pray like this. And he goes on to say, and lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. There's always going to be temptation. There's always going to be struggle for any Christ follower. And the more intimate our relationship is with Jesus, the more subtle those temptations become. The temptation for pride and the temptation for compromise and the temptation to rationalize whatever it is we want to do. And so this part of this prayer says, God, would you help me to be on guard? Similar to Jesus, when Jesus entered into public ministry, temptation came his way and yet he was grounded. And in that testing hour, he remained firm and loyal. This part of the prayer does something very specific. This part of the prayer prepares us for what we do not even know yet is coming our way. It prepares us for the unanticipated temptation. It prepares us for the deceptive evil that's coming our way. This part of the prayer helps us to be on guard. 
Instead of walking around with our guard dropped, this part of the prayer helps us to anticipate those things. And then he says, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil. He says us, the community, us, the body, us. It's this reminder that you're not alone. I'm not alone. It's this reminder that we are in this together. We are in this together. This is something that we're praying together. This is something that we're fighting for together. This is something that we get to pray and fight and believe together. Deliver us from evil. And I'm telling you, when the kingdom of God is at work, we should not be surprised when evil rears its ugly head. When the kingdom of God is moving forward, we should not be surprised when it comes our way. Instead, we should be on guard. The line of this prayer ought to bring us encouragement. It reminds us that deliverance is possible. It reminds us that God says victory is possible in him. In just a moment, I'm going to hit pause for a second and, uh, just invite you to drop any more questions that you have in the comments below. And we'd love to weave them into this morning and into Wednesday nights midweek. But in just a few moments, we're going to pray this prayer together. We're going to pray it not word for word, but we're going to pray it in a personal way. And so in a moment, we're going to come back and do that. But before we do, I want to send it back to Pastor Chuck in the studio for him to lead us for the next couple of minutes. Well, thanks so much, Pastor Bobby. What a great word, not only for this morning, but for the times that we are living in. I want to encourage you that if you're struggling and you're looking to find something solid, a foundation that you can rest on, maybe you're anxious or you're fearful, uh, maybe it's about job or your health, I encourage you to join us each weekday for weekday podcast. It's a cup of encouragement, five minutes a day, five days a week, and also the weekday meditation, just an opportunity for you to have a guided time of prayer and meditation so you can hear from the Lord. So you can jump on those any day, Monday through Friday, and they're always available on your favorite podcast platform. In just a moment, when we return to Pastor Bobby, he's going to walk us through the end of this Lord's Prayer. One of the things you can do is send us a note and let us know how we can serve you and help you. I have the privilege of being the pastor of this church, and you can send me a note at chuck at sugarhillchurch.com. It's chuck at sugarhillchurch.com, and we would love to hear from you. This Wednesday, as Pastor Bobby mentioned, we'll gather together for Sugar Hill Midweek at 7 p.m. online at live.sugarhill.church. And then we will be live Holy Week for Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday Communion, Good Friday. And yes, it will be our first digital Easter. So go ahead and start making your plans to be with us in all of those times. Pastor Bobby, thanks again for an incredible word today. I want to throw it back over to you and say to you what a joy it is to serve beside you, my friend. I love you, and I cannot wait to hear the end of our time together. Thanks so much, Pastor Chuck. You're the best. You really are. Man, our pastor, I know you guys that are part of Sugar Hill Church know this, but it goes without saying that Chuck leads with such a big heart and leads with courage. And it's been amazing just to see him pastor, not just our church, but our city and our county. And that's so amazing. Well, there's been a lot of questions that have come in throughout the week. One of those prayers or one of those questions was, why does praying with others feel more powerful than praying alone? And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. But one of those reasons is because that's the ethic of the kingdom. Uh, I know in our in our world, we think a lot of solo kind of spirituality, but when Jesus prayed, he says are and us and we and all these kind of things, these these this verbiage of us being in it together. Somebody asked the question, well, how do I even find time to pray? Uh, I read a book about uh, this last week about praying for an entire hour. And there's a lot of people that do that, but maybe you're not there yet. Maybe for you, it's praying in the shower. Or maybe it's you praying in the car ride. Somebody asked me once, should I spend 10 minutes in prayer? I think that's amazing. But even if you took one minute to pray 10 times throughout the day, that would be equally as powerful. Instead of thinking about prayer being a momentary thing to, to act like it's a phone call that you never hang up on throughout the day, that you have this ongoing conversation. Uh, one person said, well, how do you even find time? Part of it may just be to get up a little bit early. Honestly, for me, as the day goes on, my day gets a little bit more uncertain. But if I can get up 10 minutes early, 15 minutes early, 30 minutes early, and just carve out those first few minutes to pray. 
Another question is, well, how can I make my daily prayer more meaningful? Well, my hope is applying today's teaching will help with that, that we'll have a framework to think about and we can personalize it. That instead of praying sporadic prayers, we can pray specifically. One of the things we believe around here is that God answers specific prayers with specific results. Let me say that again. God answers specific prayers with specific results to have a game plan. These are great questions. If you have more, feel free to keep sh sending them in. And if we don't talk about them today, we can hit them at Sugar Hill Midweek as well on Wednesday at 7. But what's interesting about this prayer, let's get back into Matthew 6, is that for most of us, when we recite this prayer, and when we've heard this prayer, it ends with this phrase, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And what's interesting about that is that in the earliest manuscripts that we have of the New Testament, that phrase was not in there. Now, what you do find in First Chronicles 29 verse 11 is something very similar to this. We call this a doxology. A doxology means a brief expression of praise. And so what many people believe is that the early church would recite this prayer together. And so since they would pull it out of the Sermon on the Mount and pray it by itself, they put this doxology on the end as a bow, as a way of tying it all together. When it says, for yours is the kingdom and yours is the power and yours is the glory forever and ever. It's a way of praising him. It's a way of thinking about it at its deepest level. It's a way of summarizing the goal of all creation, as well as the work of the cross and the result of redemption is for God's will to be done forever and ever and ever. And I love how it ends with that one little word. Amen. Amen. Somebody messaged this week asking the question, well, what does even amen mean? And it's a way of saying yes. And I love that this prayer opens with an A word. It opens with Abba. And this prayer closes with an A word. It closes with amen. And sandwiched in between is us praying and us believing that God has a best and God has a will. And there's something that God wants done on this earth. And I find it fascinating that the first part of the prayer focuses on heaven, our father in heaven, focusing upward on him. And the last part of the prayer focuses on this earth. And in between is that phrase, on earth as it is in heaven. That heaven and earth become fused together. That the kingdom of God gets to be seen and felt and experienced. And ending with this word, amen, it means saying yes to it. Saying yes to the will of God. Yes to, to the heart of God. It, it, it's a serious business when people amen. It means I'm not doing this flippantly. I'm not doing it haphazardly. But I'm believing the best. And I'm trusting God today. I remember the first time when I was in fifth grade, we went, we moved and went to a new church. And uh, that was the first church I ever heard somebody say amen out loud in the middle of the sermon. I don't know if you've been there or not, but as a fifth grader, I'd never heard anybody do that before. And as a fifth grader, I started giggling like a little school school kid. So my pastor was preaching and got all fired up. And then somebody at the end of the road said, amen, brother. And I'd never heard it. So I start laughing. And you know those moments when you start laughing, but you're not supposed to laugh. And the harder you try not to laugh, the harder you're laughing. And so that's totally going. I never heard it. And it, for whatever reason, it struck me as funny. I still remember who, who the person is that did it too. Well, I don't know if you amen out loud or not, but I encourage you to amen whenever you say, man, God, so be it. In fact, last week on the live stream, I was following along as Pastor Chuck was teaching and one of our great members just kept amening and amening and amening. It's a way of saying yes, and so be it. God, I believe this. God, with faith, God, so be it. Let this happen. Indeed, surely make it happen, Lord. What a powerful way to end a prayer to say amen. And so I want to take a moment, and I just want to walk through this prayer. I'll basically say it line by line. But as I say it out loud, I invite you to pray it either silently or if you want to, you can say it out loud. You don't have to use the these and thous. You don't have to have some specific way of saying it. What the father cares about is that you as his child would come to him with an open heart to say, God, I'm bringing this to you. Now, if you don't know him personally, this is where it all starts. If there's never been a moment that you've put your faith and trust in him, this would be a fantastic opportunity to do it. The Bible teaches that we are separated from God because of our sin. We've all done it. We have all sinned against God 
against ourselves and others. The Bible teaches that Jesus came to this earth and that when Jesus, God himself, came to this earth, he lived a perfect, sinless life, meaning he never sinned against himself, God, or other people. So that when he went to the cross, he didn't die for, for his own sins. He died for my sins, your sins, and the sins of the world. And the Bible teaches that anyone that would ask him, that he would forgive them of their sins, and he would step out of heaven and step into their heart and become the Savior and the leader, the Lord of their life. And so if that's never happened, I would invite you as we begin to pray, to pray that. In fact, let me start there. If you've never prayed this before, but that's your heartbeat, that's the desire of your heart, you can pray this part of the prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I know that my sin separates me from you. But I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe you're alive today. And as best as I know how, I ask you to forgive me of my sins and save me. Rescue me. God, would you help me to live for you? If you pray that part of the prayer with me and you meant it, the Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. He says, you will be saved. You don't have to wonder about it. You don't have to hope for it. You can know it. And so if you prayed that for the first time and meant it, would you drop us a note today? Drop us an email at prayer at sugarhillchurch.com, prayer at sugarhillchurch.com. We've got some resources to help you take those next steps. But for all of us, I want to invite us to personalize the prayer of Jesus today and pray this together. And so if, if you're by yourself, I invite you to pray this. If you're in a room full of people, Socially distanced, I invite you to pray this as well. But let's bow our heads and let's walk through this prayer together. He opens this prayer by saying, Our Father who is in heaven, would you just talk to him like he's your dad? Would you just thank him even now, Heavenly Father, that I can have a personal relationship with you? That you're not far off, that you're not distant, but you're a father that loves his kids. Thank you. And thank you that you're in heaven, that you're not stressed out, that you're not fretting, but you're still in control. Help us to see that. Help us to find certainty in your control today. Just tell them that in your own words. As I talk out loud, you just say that in your own words. How would be your name? God, would you help us to lift up your name today? God, would you knock off any, um, any rust or grime that we've attached to your name? Would you help us to not use your name in vain? God, would you help us not to use it uh, in inappropriate ways, but that we would hold you up, we would lift you up as being holy, that we would place you above all else. Just pray that as we say, walk through this. And God, we do pray that your kingdom would come. God, in the middle of all of this, would you help us to see that the kingdom of God is alive and well? God, would you help us see your work going forward, people being saved, people being baptized, people having broken things put back together again? Help us to be sensitive to the work of the kingdom. And God, we pray it would come even more this week. God, that we would see your kingdom at work this week, that it would be obvious that you're among us and you're doing a great work. And help us not just to watch it and see it. Help us to be part of it this week. Help me to be part of it this week. And God, we pray that your will would be done. Father, would you help us to live every day like it matters and not to live out of our own plans and out of our own intellect, and out of our own ability. But God, we pray that your will would be done in our homes, that your will would be done in our marriages, that your will would be done in the way that we treat the people around us, that your will would be done in those things that we've been praying for that it seems like you haven't been answering. God, we pray that your great plan would be at work. Lord, we pray that heaven would come down to this earth. That just now in heaven, as things are being, as you're being worshiped and as your will is going forth, we pray that your will would be done in Sugar Hill as in heaven, in Gwinnett County as in heaven, in the McGraw household as in heaven. 
We just pray that over our homes and over our nation, over the world, would your will be done in Nairobi as it is in heaven. We pray this. And God, we pray that you would give us this day our daily bread. God, you know the, the needs that we have. God, you know the concerns that we have about paychecks and about food and medicine and what does longer uh, shutdowns of things look like. God, you know all those things. So we pray for today. Help us to rest in you today. Help us to not fret over something that may not even happen. Help us not to be worst case scenario thinkers today. Help us to be grateful for what we have and that we would trust you, that you're a father that loves his kid. And God, as we pray, we pray that you would forgive us where we've sinned against you. God, you know our thoughts. God, you know our motives. God, you know the, the, the ways that we know better but don't live that out. And so, Father, we pray that you would forgive us. And even now as we pray, maybe you just want to list those things. Just tell him, God, here are the things, God, that I know I need to bring back to you. God, forgive us of our sins. And God, would you help us to extend forgiveness to the people around us? Especially in this season, God, would you help us to extend your grace to the people around us? Help us to believe the best about them instead of assuming the worst. Help us to see them the way that you see them. The, in the middle of this, people are, are so stressed out. God, no wonder they're acting the way they are. God, would you help them to find peace and comfort in you? And God, as we go in today, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Help us to be on guard for what we don't even know is coming our way. The phone calls, the inconveniences, the, the un, unpaid attention to emotion that's lurking down inside of us. God, would you help us to be on guard today? And we do agree with the early church in saying, for yours is the kingdom, God. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. That's what we pray, God, is that you would be seen and felt forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. So be it, Lord. God, I pray for our people today. I pray for whatever it is they brought to you, that, God, they would be seen and felt and heard that they would look up to you instead of around to the world. Would you help all of us, myself included, to live for your kingdom today? And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What a joy to be able to walk through this prayer with you. I want to encourage you to practice this this week. Use this framework as a way to pray. Somebody asked, well, how do I, how do I pray more effectively? And I believe that scripture is one of the best ways to pray that you could take scripture and personalize it and pray it. Uh, you can do it with this prayer. You can do it from the book of Ephesians. Find some place and just pray through scripture. In just a moment, I'm going to invite Pastor Chuck back to uh, put a blessing over us as we launch into our week. But before we do, let's take just a couple more minutes and let's focus our heads and our hearts on the Lord through another time of worship. Let's sing together.